So it's a sundew highlight today. We're going to talk about Drosera capensis. Drosera capensis is one of the best plants to grow if you want to dip your toe into the pool of carnivorous plants, but you're a little nervous about what plant to grow. These plants are beautiful. Look at that dew, it's so pretty. And they're easy to grow, and they come in a lot of different color forms and leaf shapes. And that's what we're going to highlight today, because I get a lot of questions, not only about their care, but about what are the differences in these plants. Like, what is the difference between Vogelgrat and narrow red and lotus eater, right? So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to highlight that today. And we're also going to talk about their care and some of their common problems. And what I thought the best way would be to show you all the differences in these plants is if I set them up side by side here, and we could go through them and I could show you what I see as the differences. Because if you can see them through my eyes, maybe you can start to see the differences in shape and color and form and dewiness. And maybe you won't. Maybe they'll still look all the same to you. And that's totally okay, too. Um, my daughter's actually ridden horses for like half of her life. And I still cannot tell any of the horses apart. And she's always horrified. But that doesn't mean I don't think they're all really cute, right? So it's all right. Let's just go ahead and take a look at these guys. We're going to go through some of my common ones that I have available to really highlight the differences. And then we'll do some care instructions and some common problems you might face at the end of this video. So this is not by any means all of the capensis that are out there in the world, but this is a good selection so we can talk about the differences in these plants. We're going to start with the first three most commonly available. You can find these usually at most carnivorous plant shops, even sometimes in regular plant stores. The most common one, of course, is Drosera capensis narrow leaf. Narrow leaf refers to, of course, the shape of the leaf. Um, they have beautiful pink flowers. This one will flower more later, to, later on. But these are the old spent blooms here. These are the future ones. And the narrow leaf form is lovely. It can get quite large, as you can tell. It has a thin petiole. This is the petiole. And a thin leaf. And it's covered in dew. You cannot go wrong with a capensis narrow. It is lovely. Here we have the alba form. Alba is all white, as the name implies. And you can see, like, the tentacles themselves are white. That's why they have this beautiful dewy look to them. And the flowers are also white. Alba can get much bigger than this. And it has a lovely kind of ethereal glow to it because of that lack of pigment. Then we have wide leaf. Pretty self-explanatory. This guy has a thick, wide petiole and a thick leaf. And these guys tend to get pretty large as well, like the Capensis Nero and the Alba. But they always have these really lovely, thick, chonky, chonky leaves. And the important part about a wide is that it not only has a chonky leaf, but a chonky petiole too. That's the big distinguishing factor. Now let's go on to some site location plants. So site locations refer to places where these plants grow na natively, which would be in South Africa. So all of these site location plants have some slight differences between them, but what's really exciting is that they have a unique genetics because they are grown in these specific areas. This one is my current obsession. This is from Decom, and it is a beautiful, really lovely red form. So you can see that this has an unbelievable red flush to it. So when we refer to a red form on a Cape Sundew, the entire plant will be red. So that is the petiole, the leaf, and the tentacles. Now, because it is winter, this is not even at its full depth of red, because red and orange Cape Sundews tend to lose that color flush in the winter light, because there's just not as much light. If you grow it under lights, that doesn't happen. If you grow it in a windowsill or here in a greenhouse, it can lose that red pigment over the winter. Ours are just starting to turn red from all of the sun we've had intermittently between the rain. And I think this color is exceptional. It's just a lovely, lovely plant. All red, beautiful. This is Ceres. This is from Ceres, I should say. And I think this is probably my second favorite site location plant because it seems to have sort of extra bristles. And so it makes it extra dewy, extra tentacles. It's just a really lovely, lovely plant. Then we have Stellenbosch and Vogelgrat. Both of these have some slight differences. This is a slightly thicker petiole. This is really kind of a nice long plant. But site location plants you really want because of the genetics being so unique. That's what you're looking for, what you're valuing there. Then we have the cultivars. Now these are all clones of a single plant that was selected for its absolutely amazing qualities. Something like Lotus Eater is really cool. Look how thick and cool and dewy this is. It's just a beautiful, beautiful plant. And again, I'm referring to how thick the actual leaf is there. Then we have Scorpio. Scorpio is one of my personal favorites also. This is one that Damon made here. You can see that it has an extreme curve to the little 
curly cues at the top of the leaf that look like a little scorpion's tail. Better still, it has a super dark pink flower. And Scorpios also get quite large, as you can see. And then we have orange sherbet, which is like an orangey color. This is a really special one. We love this one. It's such a sweet, soft orange color, very like different than the red or the green. And if I had better color on my reds, I think you could see it more. Let's put them together so you can kind of see. See how this is more orangey and that's more of a red? That's the differences I'm talking about. So let's talk about care. These are so easy to care for. I would actually suggest you grow them as a house plant if you'd like because they don't have a typical winter dormancy or anything like that. So you can grow them indoors year round on a very sunny windowsill. And when I say sunny, I mean it. I need these plants to be getting at least six hours of light hitting their leaves every single day. They can't do indirect light and they can't do low light. A lot of people email me, why is my sun do not dewy? Because we want that dew, right? It's so beautiful. It's not dewy most likely because it's not getting enough light. Now, when you first order them and they ship all the way to your home, they may arrive not very dewy and it may take them a week or two to generate that dew. That's totally normal. But if after a couple of weeks your plant isn't dewy, that means it needs more light. So you really want to have at least at least six hours of direct sun indoors on your sunniest window. And if you're not getting that, you can invest in a little grow light. Like Sansi makes great grow lights. That's a great brand. And you're going to want that to be on a 10 to 12 hour day length, meaning that's how long you have the actual light on. And then it turns off at night. You want to have that light probably starting about a foot from your plant. And then you have to nuance, do the nuance part. You have to observe your plant. If your plant still isn't producing do, 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 you're going to need to slowly move it closer. If your plant starts to produce dew and it looks beautiful, you're fine. You can leave your plant where it is, your light where it is, about 12 inches away. But if you notice your plant is turning like an exceptionally dark color, getting really dewy, but also growing smaller, you may want to back your light off a bit because it might be a ton of light. But you know, light's a little bit tricky. You kind of have to see and watch your plant and observe and figure it out. Next is water. So these guys really love water. They want to be sitting, I put them in a deep saucer, put the pot in it, fill the saucer up with water and let it sit there. And then I just refill the water as needed. It's okay if they dry out for like a day or two, but you really don't want to dry them out more than that. And the water quality matters. So when I say pure water, I'm really not referring to like the chlorine, I'm referring to the minerals and the salts. So that's why you need to use reverse osmosis, rainwater, or distilled water because there's no minerals and salts in that. Your refrigerator water will not work. I know it's filtered, but it's not filtered enough. You can get a zero water pitcher, that works pretty well or distilled water from the grocery store or collect rainwater. It really matters. Long term, your plants will not look good and they can eventually die if exposed to too many minerals and salts in their water, which will build up in their soil. So that's an important thing. Definitely do that. Now, the last thing is going to be fertilizer. So if you grow these indoors, they will catch gnats, fruit flies, even the occasional housefly. But you're probably going to want to supplement a little bit because they are voracious eaters. So what I would recommend is you take a quarter teaspoon of maxi fertilizer. We use the 16, 16, 16 kind. You put that quarter teaspoon into a gallon of distilled water, and then you mist that on the leaves because the leaves are what want that fertilizer, right? So you don't need to put it through the soil. You can use the gallon on the rest of your houseplants if you want. They'll love it, or you can just save it and use it next time. You can do that two times a month, and they'll really appreciate it. Repotting. So if you get a plant from us, no need to repot. You're just going to stress your plant out unnecessarily after shipping. You can repot it every couple years into a nice mix of peat moss and perlite. That's what we use. All our soil recipes are on our website and available for you. These have actually surprisingly long roots. They're black, so don't forget when you see that. They're supposed to be black, and they can be quite long. That's, it. that's important, though. Don't, don't freak out if you see them and they're black. People email me all the time thinking there's something wrong. That's normal. Now, what if you want to grow these outside? You totally can. They're super versatile. So these guys, we're in zone 9. That covers zone 9A, 9B. And we grow many of these outdoors year round in the highest temperatures where it's like 105 out here and even in the cold when it's freezing at night. Now, it, let's talk about those extremes. In the winter, when you have a brief freeze, they're fine as long as the daytime temperatures come back up over 40 degrees because then the roots won't freeze. You will see the leaves die back. It will look rough. If I go show you mine outside right now, they look so pitiful because the leaves have died back. But every morning, our temperatures start to come back up over 40, and so the roots are protected below. And so as soon as spring hits, which it's starting to, which is why it's so warm in this greenhouse and I'm probably sweating profusely in this video, um, these plants will start to grow again outside. The roots are safe and they can regrow from the roots pretty reliably. They're kind of a resilient and amazing way. So that's fine. Now, if you were gonna have a prolonged freeze where your daytime temperatures were just gonna stay super low, 
I would either mulch them in heavily on the top and sides of the pot to protect the roots, or just bring them in for winter and enjoy them inside in the winter. Now let's talk about the extreme heat. They're tough. They can take the heat, but they will not look nice necessarily. So if you're going to have them outdoors and you're going to get really hot temperatures, you may want to protect them from the full brunt of the afternoon sun, or else you're going to start to see the leaf tips turn black and people really get upset about that. Um, and they may grow squattier, shorter, you know, because when plants get extra light, then they tend to shrink. So we protect ours. We put 30% shade cloth over them when we know it's going to hit that super peak heat in the afternoon with intense sun. You can do that or you can move them to where they get full morning sun all the way up until like one or two o'clock in the afternoon and then they will be a little protected. That'll work really well. So that's really the basics of care for these plants. Um, again, they're tough. You can repot them if you want uh, every year and they're, they're pretty resilient. They'll flower readily. They'll make a ton of seeds. They sell, they're self-fertile. The seeds wherever they drop will grow. You can give them away to your friends. You can harvest those seeds and sow them. They're really easy. And then the only other thing I want to talk about are the common problems. So pests, of course, unfortunately, we wish these carnivorous plants were totally resilient to things like aphids and mealybug, and they just aren't. So what do I see commonly on these? And that is aphids. Aphids are the most common pest I see associated with Cape sundews. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, but like, how would an aphid even get in my house? Like, do I need to like keep all my windows shut? No, it's just going to happen. Like, don't freak out about it. Aphids can come in on your shoes, your clothes, and in spring especially, they're very voracious. So you're going to find them. It's just going to happen. And of the pests, honestly, they're not the worst. So if you see aphids, you're going to want to treat with takedown garden spray or bare three in one. Follow the package directions and repeat treatment a few times just to get any of the straggler aphids. Aphids are really characteristic in how they damage a plant. You're going to really see very specific curly, weird, like puckered growth of the leaves and little white exoskeletons left behind. That's what I see more than I have actually see the living aphids. That's all normal. Don't worry if you see that. Just hit them with the takedown or the bare three in one and then just wait. Now, just a note that that growth will never resume on that leaf that's been damaged. It will never be normal. It'll always look a little weird, but I would just leave that growth on there even if it looks a little rough because it's still helping the plant grow. And when the new leaves grow, go ahead and cut the old yucky ones off if you don't like how they look. Otherwise, aphids rarely take a whole plant down. In this case, we usually see them being able to robustly respond because, again, they can regrow from the roots. So every now and then, if you have a super dire problem with your capensis and it's just not doing well, we recommend something very scary. And that is getting in here with your scissors and just cutting it right off at the crown because it will regrow from the roots. We've done a whole video on this. It's terrifying, but it totally works because they're tough little plants. So don't worry too much about that. That's really the two things that I hear most about are aphids and why isn't my son do dewy? And usually it's most it's mostly light. The only thing that I wanna to touch on last is that they do like a nighttime drop in temperatures. And people get a little confused by that. That means that they like a little bit of a drop in temperatures at night by 10 to 20 degrees. So if it's 70 during the day, they would love it to be 50 to 60 at night. And most of our houses have that, so it's not a big deal. But if you live somewhere very tropical, like Florida or Hawaii, you may have a hard time achieving that nighttime drop in temperature. And in that case, you may notice your plant grows a little weird. We've seen this over the years. And so I would actually recommend Capensis alba. Alba seems to be more resilient to that, that, that issue with nighttime drop in temperatures. So if you live in an area where you don't reliably get those nighttime drop in temperatures, try alba. It tends to be a little bit better with that. So I hope that this was helpful. I hope that you can see a little bit of the differences. But again, if you can't, that's totally fine. They're still beautiful, right? I always think of the story that Peter told years ago before these were ubiquitous in the hobby and before they were available. Peter finally saw one for the first time in his adult life at the San Francisco um, Botanical Garden. And he was blown away by how stunningly beautiful it was. And because they're easy to grow, people have a tendency to kind of be like, mm, whatever, it's just a capensis. But that's really looking a gift horse in the mouth. Why would we say that this is any less magical or beautiful than another carnivorous plant just because it's actually not difficult to grow? It's stunning. It's beautiful. It was once very hard and rare to find. And when I look at it, I think of the wonder Peter would have had when he saw this growing for the first time ever. It's just a magical gift to us that this one is beautiful, easy, flowers. It's a wonderful thing. So I definitely recommend you try to collect a few different cultivars, enjoy them, enjoy the different colors and forms because why make your life harder? Sometimes it's nice to have an easy plant and this is the one.